All right, so a little bit more on the Wright brothers. We talked about them up until 1903, uh, last time. And so they came home uh, in December <clears throat> and set about building the Wright Flyer too. That's a photograph of it outside the shed at Huffman Perry. Um, it had a new wing camber. <clears throat> it had a more powerful motor. It had modified controls which were less sensitive than they had been in the first model. It was a bit of a dog to fly, this one and the one before. The brothers then set about patenting their invention and this, could have, this probably caused most of the troubles that they ended up with. They <coughs> patented it in words which made it difficult for other people to manipulate or control an aeroplane. Maybe they didn't want to give their secrets away uh, in saying too much about what they had achieved. They certainly had achieved a lot. They organised uh, a demonstration with the press and it was a complete failure because they couldn't get the, the show on the road. <laughs> so it was abandoned and it took Wilbur 14 sorry, 19 attempts to get airborne at a later date. And this is where they developed the catapult or the drop tower with the weight and uh, the longer, they extended the length of the track for the takeoff. And so more and more was held away from people who may have been able to help them. By the end of 1904, that made 105 flights quite a, a record, considering that hardly anyone else in the world had even <laughs> broken wind. They'd flown in straight lines and they'd flown S-turns, they'd flown a complete circuit of the field. Two flights had um, <clears throat> been in the air for over five minutes. As I said, no one else in the world had really got anywhere near um, that mark. And just think of the progress they'd made in that time. 1904, at the end of 1904, they've mastered the art of gliding. They've made two or three thousand glides. They've conducted aerofoil comparisons. They've conducted wind tunnel testing, means of lateral control and pitch control. No one else uh, in the world was up to that. They've even analysed <coughs> adverse yaw, which is a hard drag, because as the aircraft is rolled in, uh, in attitude, it introduces drag, and uh, they are analysing that. They practice power flight uh, more than anyone else. They actually analyse propeller design as well, as you can see by that diagram. Um, the uh, propeller had to be treated um, at various radius to uh, have a different angle of attack. <coughs> They were also aware that the centre of pressure was moving on the wing as they changed the angle of attack and they'd analyse and experience the stall. Wilbur heard a flapping noise. It turned out there was a buffet before the stall. No one to teach him about it, no one to show him the way. Some of what <coughs> they set up uh, seems a little bit odd today, but there's no rule book to follow. Since the weight was asymmetric, they added four inches four and a half inches onto a wingtip to counteract that to some degree. The pilot was laying down, usually Wilbur, but often Orville as well. And lateral control was by moving the hips from side to side. In the left hand was a lever that operated the elevator <coughs> out in front, and the right hand operated the leader lever, which controlled the rudder. There was also a cord between the motor and the right hand, which they could pull to shut the motor off if things weren't working out. 1905, <clears throat> another new engine, more horsepower. They eliminated the anhedral, or the downward bend of the wings. They changed the seating and uh, the flying controls to a new system. They went for the uh, upright seated position they then uh, started flying figures of eight in Huffman Prairie uh, on the field. Um, once again, 
that taken the the art of flying to a new level. And by the end of 1905, they'd actually flown for over 30 minutes on a number of occasions. And so what they'd done is <coughs> they'd developed a flying machine, <coughs> which over which they had control in pitch, roll and yaw. Other aviators or attempt, people who were attempting to aviate uh, didn't have any idea. And so you could say that by the end of 05, they'd mastered the art of sustained, controlled, powered flight. They had a few problems with this bloke because on the 7th of October, he pushed the Langley aeroplane off um, a, pont, a punt in the, the river. <coughs> it flew about twice its own length and crashed into the water. <coughs> Langley had been experimenting with aircraft oh, for probably over 10 years. He had built scale models, he put various types of engines in them, um, and some of the models worked reasonably well, but his full size uh, aircraft didn't work at all. However, the Smithsonian Institute, which employed him, had put $50,000 into his research and they wanted to capitalise on this. So they said that he had designed the first aircraft capable of flight, manned flight. And so they then took the wreck that they got out of the Potomac River and strung it up in the Smithsonian Museum and said this aircraft made the first flight, first man-powered flight, sorry, man-controlled flight. So that <clears throat> upset the Wright brothers because they'd actually really flown an aeroplane um, a couple of months afterwards, December 1903. In 1906, the Wright brothers ceased flying. They didn't do any flying at all in 1906. They continued with engine development. They concentrated on the the two-seater design, another new control system. And they started to talk to the US military. They were approached by a number of people and organisations who wanted to capitalise on their invention. But the Wright brothers really wanted to get government contracts. That's where they saw the money. And that was why they were secretive, because they wanted to expose what that uh, developed to the governments. Of course, they're dealing with bureaucrats, and they didn't know very much about uh, what the Wright brothers had been up to. So it was, <laughs> once changed, it was self-defeating in some way. They pursued contracts in France, and they had offers from Great Britain. Big money was mentioned, 125,000 pounds from the British to take over what that developed. 200,000 francs from the French. But there were provisos in there which they weren't very happy with. In their new control system, they combined the right hand lever into left and right for the aileron, sorry, for the uh, wing warping and back and forth gave them rudder and not elevator. You see that photo every now and then in the books of Wilbur sitting at the Wright Flyer of 1908. That operated the rudder and the wing warping. That hand operated the elevator. And the feet were just on a footrest and didn't do anything. Seems a bit odd to us in this day and age. So after not flying in 1906, the <coughs> Frenchman, or person who lived most of his life in France, um, got himself organised in 1906, did some fast taxiing, and then made a 21 second hop. And the papers went mad. This man is flying an aeroplane. Have a look at the, the diagram, uh, the, the photograph. It is really a box kite developed by Hargraves. They've copied the Wright brothers by having that great big elevated device out the front and to push a propeller, single engine. So he was regarded as the greatest flyer ever and of course the Wright brothers in their secretive manner couldn't um, or hadn't shown the world what they'd been up to. 
So in 1907, the Wright brothers produced another model, the Model A, and they went to France, went to Europe, to discuss the prospects of sales. They opened negotiations with the US Signals Corps, and uh, Orville was involved in setting up the uh, contract, which they eventually were successful with. But due to their patent, <coughs> they found themselves tied up in legal problems. Rather than fly or develop an aircraft, they found themselves in the courts. In 1908, Wilbur went to France after getting approval from the French government to, to carry out uh, demonstrations. In his first flight, he flew for one minute and 45 seconds. In the audience, uh, was a man called Louis Blerio. Soon after that, <coughs> Wilbur won the Michelin Cup, 23,000 francs, for flying 123 kilometres in two hours and 18 minutes. He was the toast of France and the world. Up until that time, the Wright brothers were called liars or flyers with a question mark. <laughs> they thought they were bluffers, so this was the proof that they could achieve what they set out to do. While Wilbur was in France, Orville went to Fort Myer to demonstrate the flyer um, to the US Army. And unfortunately, after performing to in excess of what they'd hoped for and carrying passengers and setting records for height and distance, one of the aircraft, or sorry, the aircraft crashed. A uh, propeller disintegrated, it had a crack in it, they serviced it, but not as we would today. It uh, broke apart, vibration caused the aircraft to uh, suffer structural failure. And so Thomas Selfridge was killed in that particular accident, which was a black mark to the Wright brothers, but they recovered from it. and. Uh, the US Army uh, kept up with the uh, pursuit of flight. By putting the patent down in the words that they did, other people were held back. Another developer in America was Glenn Curtis. And in those two photographs, you can see that he had attachments on the end of the wing. The top one, makeshift ailerons, and the center of the second one, uh, there is a, a, an aileron uh, between the, the two wings. But he ended up a bitter enemy of the Wright brothers. He eventually sold one of his aeroplanes for $7,500 and the Wright brothers sued him for patent breach. The Wright brothers also wanted money from any European who came to America or went to America and flew. They, the Wright brothers would get someone to examine their aircraft, see if it had lateral control, wing warping or ailerons, and then they'd say, right, we're going to take legal action against you, against you, or you can pay us some money. And so they became very unpopular. Louis Blerio crossed the channel in 1909, <clears throat> and he had a much more conventional, as we think today, aircraft. Not a biplane, but a monoplane and a tail out the back, which made a lot more sense than the Wright brothers' design. And of course, once the Europeans, and there were many of them attempting to fly, once they got the idea that um, this aeroplane of Louis Blériot's was a success, and they needed to have lateral control, um, and control of pitch and yaw, uh, they went ahead in leaps and bounds and so people right throughout Europe and England started to develop aircraft, very successful ones. And so the Wrights were overtaken by the European development, much more powerful engines, very controllable aeroplanes, and virtually none of them, maybe apart from the Bristol box guy, uh, had the elevator out the front. They all went for a tail plane. So the Wright brothers had to suffer inherent instability, the poor performance of the forward elevator, 
they continue with the skid undercarriage and, and the catapult instead of wheels and they continue with wing warping instead of ailerons. And so that combined with the legal problems and this man Wilbur spent the last two year, years of his life in legal battles rather than developing aircraft. And so he died of typhoid in 1912. The Wright brothers <coughs> set up their own aviation company producing aeroplanes. They had subsidiary companies in France and Germany producing aircraft for sale to governments and budding air forces. But the Smithsonian <coughs> refused to recognise the Wright brothers' achievement. They still had Langley's aeroplane on display and then they asked the Wright brothers in 1910 if they would be good enough to give one of their early models so it could be displayed in the Smithsonian Institute as well and it would be given second billing because Langley, according to them, made the first flight and the Wright brothers would be relegated to second. So the Smithsonian and uh, Orville ended up in a dreadful war turned out that by 1925 he had decided that he was going to give the right flyer, model number one, that flew on Decem in December 1903 to the museum in London, to the Science Museum. This didn't take place until 1928 when <clears throat> on the 25th anniversary of that first flight the transfer was made and the right flyer stayed in the Science Museum until the early part of World War II. Negotiations were made for it to come back to America and it did come back in 1948 but by that time Orville had passed away so he didn't see it come back to the United States. Orville's family and lawyers settled the dispute, got the aircraft back to America and wrote in the return a very strict set of um, instructions that if the Smithsonian relegated this to second or some other place and put another aircraft in front of it, that it would be taken out of Smithsonian. And so it was returned to the United States. Everyone was happy. That's the celebration on its mm -hmm. first display mm -hmm. in the United States. And so that really finished the story of the run.